Hey there, my name's Rick. I just want to give my feedback and my hypothesis on a thread that I've seen on a certain th forum. And sorry about the racing cars and also the failing light, but this is absolutely my last opportunity to make this video that I really wanted to make. So, this is offered not to piss anybody off particularly, but it could be quite volatile. And, uh offered with the advice that when you know better you do better but maybe you already know this and you do know better but if you don't you know please let me know so that I'll know better too all right gonna read gonna read what was on this forum so we'll call the little girl Al who as it will soon be seen is five this is a message from her mum now Al has been expressing some wonderful new defiant five-year-old behavior which has been quite the roller coaster ride in adapting to these new behaviours, one in particular, I haven't the slightest clue about how to handle. The I'm doing what you requested as slow as possible action. Obviously saying things like hurry up is useless and demeaning. I agree. This is one of her particular favourites. This is her go-to behaviour for acting up with adults outside the family. In this case, it isn't that I'm rushing her and trying to get her to do things beyond her pace or what she needs. Has anyone else dealt with this? What are some things I could try? And at that point, I got to have a reply, and despite her saying, uh, thanks, this is, that it's, in this case, it isn't that I'm rushing her and trying to get her to do anything beyond her pace. Uh, it actually does turn out that the particular event that triggered me, actually sitting down, and posting was a staircase that she was asked to stay off in a friend's house that had already been explained as off-limits. It was also happening with eating, getting dressed, or leaving the cats alone. So it does turn out that this sort of response of, as we say, well I'm going to call it passive resistance, or, you know, I'm doing what you requested as slow as possible action. It does seem to be solicited by particular actions. and. I mean, if there's any doubt about that, just imagine asking this little five-year-old girl, Al, to go and watch cartoons, or, hey, come and eat some candy, or do something that you love. She wouldn't do the passive resistance thing. She'd be running. It'd be like fire on the carpet, where there's a trail, like the flash, where she's rushing off to do it. So these appear, you know, when children and adults, too, actually don't want to do what they're doing. But I think this is where I get into what my opinion is. I think this is when someone cannot outright say no, cannot fight back. What a person will fall into is passive resistance, and that's literally formally what Gandhi taught his people to do in, in India uh, some 60, 70 odd years ago, where people literally, you know, you want to carry them out of, out of the streets or wherever you're protesting, and they just go floppy and become a dead weight. And you can beat them up and hit them with sticks and shoot them and not to draw too strong a parallel with what is being done to Al here but that's kind of where I'm coming from it's a kind of Nietzschean slave mentality that people fall into when they can't can't show anger they have to become floppy and passive resistant and basically make life hell for the people they're trying to cooperate with and apart from remembering my history about India I also remember studying this in criminology where the professor talked about how you cannot make prisoners do anything they do not want to do. I mean, you, you take some guys out to do some kind of cool hand look, yard, um, work, yard, yard work or road work or something, and as soon as the guard turns his back, the, the guys drop all the nails and the hammers and all the, the rakes and the spades into a hole, and they're never seen again. And if the guard says, hey guys, where are all the tools? They're all like, we don't know. So it's back to the yard and it's a day wasted and you just blew all your, you know, your government money on tools. Gone down the hall. That's Nearly funny. done. It's a bit funny. It's a bit silly and it's a bit nasty when you're on the receiving end of that kind of treatment. Anyway, that's where I'm coming from, so I'm trying to get that one across. So I wanted to tell Al's mum that yes, I've experienced it too and I remember it from the Indians. I do also want to tell her that I really appreciate that she described it as, you know, expressing wonderful defiant behaviour. This is really nice. Like The mum obviously is doing her best here and trying to be nice and trying to be understanding of her child and she didn't say my child is ridiculous or stupid, she said she's expressing wonderful defiant behaviour. Anyway, we're all 
trying to do the right thing here. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, I advised that Elle should be asked herself. Like, you don't know what the context is, although in reply to that I got, you know, getting dressed, leaving cats alone, and getting off a staircase that you've been told to, and eating. Um, so, yeah, by asking that question I, I found out what, what it is that's particularly bothering this child. But still, you know, you've got to ask the child herself. That was my big thing. But instead of saying, oh, good good idea, Rick, it was more like, let's, let's have a little bit more of a theoretical pondering about what could be the cause of this, which isn't quite where I'm going with. I think you ought to ask the child, what is it that's, you know, bugging you about these things? Talk it through. Why are you going into this passive resistance thing, which, you know, I don't know your kid, but nine times out of ten, in my experience, every time I've seen it, and God, I've been on the receiving end of it, and I've tried this tactic myself, it's because they they don't like you, they don't like what's being done, they don't feel that they can express it in words, so they're expressing it with their body by going limp, by being resistant. Um, so there's no doubt that that Al would, would not behave that way if she was asked to do something she loved to do. Anyway, so... I call this, what's that child thinking? It's the game where you just, instead of like asking the child <laughs> what they want, it's to say, go away child, I'm going to have a big theory. Thank you. <laughs> mm. I know what you want. I was going to get you so big. You were cuddling me big. Uh, instead of asking the child what they want, you say, you know, go away little child, and then you have a think, maybe with your husband or wife. What does this child want? Let's think, what could it be? <laughs> Quiet, stop stop pestering me, child. I don't want any actual empirical input here. That's what kind of blows me. I don't know if I can say blows me in American context. People are going to get the wrong idea. But it blows me away that, you know, as an objectivist and an empiricist, nobody besides myself seems to care about checking out the actual data by talking about the child, or to the child particularly. I don't want to talk about them. So I think you should go empirical, especially if you're an... Um, an objectivist. You've got to. Not just introspect, not think about, hmm, what could it be, but I've been down that track before. Uh, I'll read what I said here. I oh, know I won't. Will I? Alright, just in brief. I don't quite understand what the mother said in this little bit about how it happens, but it's easy to deal with. Like she says, the eating thing is easy to deal with. Because when the child goes passive resistance, my words, uh, it's easy to fix because you send the child away to make their own food. Well, if it's easy to deal with and it's working, how come that's one of the triggers? Uh, likewise, it's easy to thwart your child because uh, when they're getting dressed, you're um, you're able to... Uh, I don't know what it is. The word thwarted was used. I think the child is unable to go out unless they dress properly, so they get thwarted. Now, you see, that plays into my hands, into my theory. If I think that you are mistakenly falling into the British Empire slash um, prison guard role here, then using the word, I thwarted my prisoner, you know, <laughs> that makes me think, ah, yeah, I'm right. Anyway, uh, what else? Oh, there's also, yeah, this is easily thwarted, doesn't make me doubt myself, makes you look like, yeah, I don't need to get into a Muppet movie reference. Alright. I know you love the Muppets, me too. Yeah, so that's basically all I wanted to say about that one. Like, talk to your kid, right? I'm pretty sure that what's going on here is that you're sowing the seeds of procrastination and they're germinating already. Um, I won't do a whole thing about procrastination, but that's one of my things too. Um, what happens is this child is basically procrastinating. It might not be recognisable as that, but that's what I believe it to be. That your kid is going to grow up later and procrastinate about doing important things because they'll hear sort of their mother's voice in their ear telling them to do it and you have to do it and your your time limit is on and then they're going to feel this resistance, this passive resistance that fights them in their own lives, which you're already seeing here. So if you don't want your kid to grow up to have this enormous procrastination complex about their whole damn life, uh, maybe stop now. Maybe talk to them now. Try a different trick. And I'm a bit disappointed that... Um, Maybe I didn't express myself well, but what I said did not get picked up on, did not get appreciated, and in fact, people are counselling the opposite. Like, crank up the authoritarianism, if anything. And I'll do a little bit about that. There's, there's one correspondent who 
took over from me, or took over from me, seized the initiative from me, if you like, the way I see it, and she said, uh, there is a, a less well-known five-year-old limit testing stage that is similar to the two- to three-year-old limit testing stage. She may have found a new way of dealing with things she doesn't like, and this is now testing to see if it works. Well, I don't think that's a good idea uh, for two reasons. One is you're, you're putting the locus of control outside your child and your relationship with your child. So instead of you know me to you, talking, talking kind of thing, it's now continuing this problem of introspecting about your child and blaming a category. And eh, maybe that could work sometimes, but my concern here is, okay, You've got an infant, so there's infancy, so you say, oh, it's not to do with the child or what happened in our life. It's not the circumstances. Now we've got airplanes. It's because they're an infant. Or then it's when they're two years old. Oh, well, it's a two to three year old limit testing stage. Or or when they're four or five, or particularly five. Hang on, I'm nearly done. Um, then you say, oh, well, there's a less well-known five year old limit testing stage. And then, of course, when you get to 10 and onwards, it's adolescence. And then when they're a teenager, uh, it's because they're a teenager. Ah, I've got no problems with my child. There's, there's no issues with our relationship. They don't have problems with patting cats or taking their food or getting dressed. It's just adolescence. It's just teenagerness. So that gets you through the years 13 to 19, and then they're 20, and I guess then maybe you'll talk to them as an adult, uh, which is what I do with my three-year-old here immediately. <laughs> you are growing up. And, of course, if you don't have a less well-known limit testing stage to refer to as a, um attribution theory error, in my opinion, uh, you can always blame it on ADHD, right? Or maybe a food allergy. Don't know, just saying, as soon as you go down that track, uh, there's not many opportunities left to actually talk to your kid about what's going on. Anyway, let's get back into this advice. Um, I don't really want to hang anyone out to dry here, and repeating it, you know, she could write it on the forum already, so that doesn't upset people, but reading it is like kind of an indictment for me. So, you know, for example, when my kids started getting ready very slowly and playing tons, even when I was in a rush, we had to reset the rules of getting ready. Reset the rules. She says we. I'm pretty sure it's about her, the adults, the parents, right? Not the children. Uh, uh, say I cannot wait... Uh, this is the advice. Say, I cannot wait for you to move slowly. You can either move quickly or I will have to enforce the rule by picking you up. Uh, this... Blah, blah, blah. So, particular to the staircase thing, give her the choice to stay away or if she can't be trusted to sit next to you until she can be trusted. Uh, okay, That's not a choice, that's an ultimatum. You're not giving the choice this or that, you're giving an ultimatum. That you have to come and sit with me and you know lose your freedom of association, or you don't get to be free-range kid anymore, you're, you've got this choice, behave or else. So, you know, you can see why I may be mistakenly thinking that this is the prison guard mentality and you're trying to tell your kid what to do, and or at the very least that they're interpreting it that way and responding with this passive resistance thing, with the, you know, the germ of procrastination. Um, oh, and it goes on that, you know, if she keeps acting out, now, acting out, I do not appreciate that language. I think the child is is not acting out. I think that they're doing all they can and they're kind of desperate in this situation. Uh, it might be time to find a babysitter and to leave her at home a couple of times. So... Yeah, as I said, that kind of speaks for itself to me. I think that's really rotten and horrible. Instead of interacting with your child, you're now going to drop a sitter on them, some stranger or someone else, instead of the parents that they love being with, and they miss out on opportunities because they don't respond the way you want to. Uh, and I could talk a bit about more language about characterising this as acting out and flipping out, which I don't appreciate very much. I don't think it's helpful. But I'll just say a little bit from a book called Dumbing Us Down, John Taylor Gatto. Um, what he says about resetting the rules, changing them when, you know, the kid isn't doing what you want them to do, so you give them ultimatums to change the rules, prison guard style. He says, this is a, from the school teaching, teaching public school context though, 
He says, confusion. Everything is taught out of context. The unrelatingness of everything. The disconnections. Um, it causes panic and anger. But kids lack the words to stand up to those causing this. Constant violations of natural order and sequence. Changing the rules, giving ultimatums. Students learn that confusion is normal and accept it as their destiny. And that's what I'm saying. Very nicely put by that bloke. That if you keep changing, resetting the rules, the kids are not... They're going to take that on board. They're just going to think, ah, there are no rules. They just change all the time. Are we about done here? Okay. I guess I, I said enough, and I just want to re reiterate, um, I'm sorry if this makes anyone go crazy. If you think it's not a good idea, let's just talk about it. Um, on the other hand, if, if this just makes you crazy because of my tone, or because it doesn't make sense, or because... Hmm, which is what I think might be occurring here, like this is a bitter pill to swallow, uh, when you know better, you do better, but sometimes when you know better, you get pissed off at the person who told you, and you tell them that you don't like the way that they're delivering things, or, I don't know, you don't have any children of your own, or... Da, da, yeah, okay. So I said I'd wrap this up, so I will. Anyway, hopefully that video worked, and I did not have to do it in a second take, because God knows this is the last opportunity I have. Thank you.